All right. Well, we're going to talk about contentment today. Yeah, being content. So in Philippians 4, 10 through 13, Paul wrote, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's a, a fairly common passage that we've probably heard a lot of, particularly the last part of it. But that's going to be kind of our main text, what we're going to look at, but we're going to bounce around a lot. But as a society, just as people and Christians and everything, we face discontentment on a daily basis. Like that's something that just sort of almost seems to be like a natural part of our lives. But in reality, we as Christians are designed to actually be content, not discontent. But discontentment comes from a variety of places. Uh, it can come from envy of others' possessions. It can come from envy of others' successes. It can come from even just not feeling content with where you are in relation to yourself. You know, some people comparing themselves against themselves. Uh, but our, in our culture, there is a gigantic wave of discontentment that is coming through, particularly in the younger generations. Um, and I know sometimes I mention generations. Sometimes I get fascinated by a study of generations. I think that came about because I saw a study on Gen X. And one of the things that marks Gen X is that like, we're all like, we're unique and different and no one can define us. And then I read like the description of the Gen X and I was like the poster boy for it. And I'm like, how's that possible that a generation that stood up on being no one can define us is so clearly defined. <laughs> but, but anyway, but Gen Z, one of the things that has come come with with them is this real bad discontentment with where they are financially, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting because they're just entering the mar the workplace, mm -hmm. and so you have people. In fact, I read this the story of where they were interviewing multiple of these Gen Zers, and basically what they're saying is they're looking at their grandparents and like the their average grandparent of these people that they were interviewing say had a house two cars, uh, some of them may have had even like a small lake house. Now, not like a second house you could live in, but like a little, vacation. yeah, like a little vacation place sitting on a lake that, or maybe a timeshare, and then they owned like a small boat. And they were saying, I can't fathom being able to afford this stuff. And I get that, I understand that discontentment. But also, like in my generation, we were taught like, well, like our parents didn't have that when they were our age. And like probably there's grandparents that have all that stuff, didn't have that at the very beginning of their careers. They're now at the end of their careers. And, you know, I think that the average Gen Z grandparent or parent of a Gen Zer, grandparent of a Gen Zer is either fully retired or like just about to switch into retirement. And so it's like, yeah, we didn't have that back then. I think of Tina's grandparents on her dad's side and the first time that i met them it was like wow they, they've done well for themselves they've got this huge house with this like wraparound porch that goes like the entirety of the house and it was like not just when i say huge house like their house is like featured on a tour of the city it's a historic landmark it's you know that they rebuilt and uh they had this gigantic fifth wheeler and the gigantic truck needed to pull a gigantic fifth wheel and it just seemed like they, you know, there. But then one time, not so many years ago, they were at our house and they were telling us stories about when they first got married. And it was like, they were talking about stories of like sleeping in areas with no heat and having absolutely nothing and running and jumping to catch trains that they couldn't afford tickets to and like riding in the box cars and stuff. Like that, that's definitely a different era. Um, I know, so hard to picture her doing that. But they were like, yeah, because we had nothing. Like, we had literally nothing. And they were, like, chasing jobs, trying to have money. And it's like, wow, that's so not my picture of her grandparents at all. Um, but discontentment arises from things like that because people are, 
interestingly, in my mind, that's making an unfair comparison. I'm going to compare what is, you know, my financial success after three years of working with someone who has now spent 35 years working. You know, it's like, okay. But there is waves of discontentment just sweeping through our culture right now. And almost everyone is being very discontent with stuff. Well, Paul understood the need for contentment. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, he said, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. And it's like, there's something there where it's like, wow, I should be content to just have enough food and clothes. And that's it. But that's actually not really what he says, if you look at that verse. Yeah, I mean, he's got the definite parent statement there. You brought nothing in this world, you're taking nothing out, you know. <laughs> but, but it starts off with something that, that gets into a little bit of the secret of contentment. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, not just contentment. So there's something there we'll have to come back to. In Philippians 4, 11 through 12, back into our main text, but just a, a small portion of it, he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So things like covetousness or envy, um, those things and contentment cannot coexist. In fact, envy destroys our happiness. Contentment allows happiness and joy where envy pushes it out of reach. Envy and jealousies really make things, make, make happiness always a moving target. It's always pushing it just past your grasp. Whereas being contentment is one of the secrets of actually experiencing real happiness. Um, now I'll tell you that that is going to be partly going back to that first Timothy where he says godliness with contentment is great gain because that's one of the secrets of real actual joy and happiness is having you know, Christ in us. But jealousies and envies always seems to like push it out. When we, you know, one of the traps that we fall into is looking on social media because it makes us think we know what someone else's life is like when in fact we really don't. Because we can look at someone else's social media life and be like, man, they're always going on trips and always on these vacations and always having a good time and always happy. And I know many people that have told me they only post pictures of the good stuff and mostly they're miserable. You know, but they're not, they don't want to post the pictures of them being miserable. Then I also do know people that only post when they're miserable, which I think is weird. But anyways, <laughs> social media really does make us think we know someone else, what someone else's life is like. And we really don't know. If that's the only way we know them, we really don't know what their life is like. Well, people might say, well, we pick on social media a lot. But I'll tell you the same thing is true for now, less here because there's so, you know, there's not that many of us. And so we kind of know each other better. We're a little bit more like family. But it's easy to be in a church and have that same thing where you think you know what someone's life is like because it's easy to show up on a Sunday morning in a, in a bigger church and be like all smiles and, you know, laughing and everything's great. And on the inside, you're not at all. I used to be a part of a church out in Ponte Vedra called Redeemer Church. And we was all, and I was on staff there. And so the pastor would always talk to us and say like, we are in the midst of a, an area where people want to put on a show because this is where everyone is supposed to be wealthy and happy. And so he, he called them the up and outers. Hmm. They're not the down and outers <laughs> because they've got plenty. But, they, but he's like, you know, it would be common to have somebody come in and be like, everything is fine. And they've got, you know, they're driving a $100,000 car. They've got a huge house and everything. But also, you know, their teenage son is strung out on drugs. Their marriage is two days away from <laughs> divorce. They are, you know, they're going through it. And it's like really bad. So... The fact is a lot of times where our envy and our jealousies are based on things that aren't even real. They're not even true. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes our envies or jealousies can be based on things like someone else's talents or giftings. We're like, man, I wish I could be like that person in the church or, you know, they sing so well or they 
play this instrument or they're so, you know, artistic and gifted in these areas. Well, all talents and gifts are given by God. And honestly, to be envious of a talent or a gift is to question God's design for you because God made you the way that you are. Sometimes, though, we get confused with that kind of stuff. I know like in growing up, I was taught that things that I actually really enjoy now, you know, I was taught by my parents who just didn't know better at the time that that's like horrible. It's a waste. Like if it's not either hard science or hard math, you're wasting your life. And anything artistic, anything like that is an absolute <laughs> just waste of time and effort. So sometimes those things may come to us because we get repressed, but we, you know, and so God's designed for us, but that's probably a whole nother lesson about the, the repression of God's design for us. But lack of contentment and who I am, what I am, and what I have is always what's going to drive envy. But Paul said that he found the actual secret to contentment. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a thing to say, like, I'm content <laughs> where I'm weak, when people are insulting me, when I'm being persecuted, when I'm going through hardships, when I have facing calamity, like, all these things, I still can be content to have these things present in my life. Whereas most of us think that our contentment is based on the circumstances we have in life. If just these things would not be in my life, I would be content. Or if just I had these things in my life, I could be content. But Paul's basically saying, my contentment is not based on what's present or what's lacking from my life. In fact, I have found that I can be content with all these things. And then going back to Philippians 4.11, the main text, he said, now that I speak in regard not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, Paul is not saying <clears throat> that he is content right now just because he got a gift from a church, right? When we started this, this passage off, he says in Philippians 4.10, remember it opened up with, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So what has happened here is a, uh, Epaphroditus has brought a gift from Macedonia to Paul, you know, missionary support, and they didn't have an ability to wire gifts. So they actually had to like load him up with monies and things and send a person to him. And that was, you know, it was much harder to get your money to your missionaries back then. So they did it. And what had happened is they had been supporting Paul for a while if you're familiar with the story of the Macedonian church, they went through a time of extreme poverty where they just, I mean, they were being persecuted and they were like, all the Christians were losing their jobs and it was getting very difficult for them. And it was a very bad time in the Macedonian church. And so their, their giving went way down. And it wasn't with the Macedonians, it wasn't that their giving went down because they just didn't want to give or anything like that, or that they just fell out of the spiritual discipline of giving. It was because they literally had no money. Like they, they hit extreme poverty. And now Paul receives this unexpected gift because again, they couldn't call him up and say, Hey, we're reinitializing support. You know, they send somebody and they, they sent somebody with the gift. And so when he says at last, it's not this thing of, Oh, finally, you know, <laughs> I've been, I've been waiting on y'all to come through with your missionary giving. You know, I've been hurting over here. That's not what Paul's tone is. It's more like it's been a while and Paul is just thankful that they're back into that place. Like at last, I've been praying for you. I've been petitioning on behalf of God. In fact, if you read all around this in other places like in Acts or in places, you find Paul is continually praying for the Macedonian church through their time of persecution. And so when he sees this gift from them, he's like, oh, hey, there's been breakthrough. You actually have money to resume the support. And so he, that's where this at last, he's so thankful for the gift, but he's not thankful for the gift because Paul wants the money. He's thankful for the gift because it symbolizes that they are having breakthrough, that things are letting up, that they're actually, they actually have some money. 
And so he stresses that this is not for the money. It's one of the reasons we know this. In fact, in Philippians 4.11, he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned whatever state I am to be content. I know I keep bringing that verse back up, but it keeps being relevant. Um, but then in, in 17, in, in verse 17, he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And that's a great way for him to express what he's been trying to say this whole time. And I know that goes outside of the text we're looking at, but it shows what he was, what he was really thinking there. So he's like saying, hey, there is, <laughs> there is something to your giving. And it's like, I'm happy for you guys that you're doing this, but I want you to understand I'm not happy because I'm so happy to receive the money. I'm going to be content whether I have plenty or whether I have little, it's fine. I can be content. But when you're giving, God's going to bless that. And so he's talking about the fruit that's going to be abounding in their account. He's saying like, God's noticing this and God's going to bless you. In fact, in Acts 20, 35, it says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so I left that off of that. Yeah, I left the most important part. I just didn't copy that part when I pasted it in. But it, I promise you that the actual <laughs> scripture does end with... <laughs> Remember the words of the Lord. <laughs> I don't know what he said, but we should remember it. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's weird that I did that. <laughs> and I think this is a great picture of the body of Christ. That the body of Christ is the one who shares with the one who doesn't have. That's why it's more blessed to give than receive. When the body of Christ is working the way that the body is intended to work, then those with share with those without. And it's always making up the difference. There's always that thing. And so that's like, the, that's like the actual body of Christ really coming together, functioning like it should. And that's what Paul's seeing here with Macedonia. They've been through a time of need. Now they're coming on that. Paul's in a time of need. They're sharing with him. And it's working together like the body should. But we come to this back to the secret of contentment in 412 when he says, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer in need. So Paul had learned the secret of contentment and he had learned it by being in both situations. He really knew what it was like to be in, in both situations. In fact, the church of Philippi met in Lydia's house. And Lydia was, I always think it's amazing when, when the Bible talks about that a a large number of people came to know the Lord early on. It's kind of interesting how it says it. If you read Acts, it'll talk about how there was one day like 3,000 people came to the, to the Lord. And then on, like on another time, 5,000 people came to know the Lord and joined the church. And it, it singles some people out when it, when it talks about that because it'll say there were, there were at least 3,000 men. And then it will always say, and not a few prominent women. And that not a few prominent women is really key. And the reason that it's really key is because God specifically brought wealthy single women into the early church for a reason. They had huge houses without people in them, and they used those to establish the church. And so Lydia was one of these people. She was one of these not a few prominent women, you know. There were many of these prominent women that came in. Lydia was a dealer in purple and she was wealthy. Like she was obscenely wealthy. And so she had this gigantic house. And so when Paul set up the church in Philippi, he was invited to be in Lydia's house. And she brought him in as a guest and basically said, everything that is mine is yours. So Paul lived in this mansion that later you know, that was also hosting a church where it probably had matching towels and all the little yeah. guest soaps and you know everything that you would you know everything he could want and need was there he probably had a team of servants that waited on him that gave him whatever foods he wanted and ate like a king you know whether he wanted to or not that's just probably what was given and 
And so he knew what it was like to live that way. And in fact, multiple of the churches were set up where there was these women. Nympha had a church in her house and she was probably one of these, actually it says like she was extraordinarily wealthy. And several other women that um, had these just gigantic homes and Paul would go in and those were the people that would bring him in and establish the church and he would stay there. So he knew what it was like to live that way. But also a lot of times Paul had nothing but, you know, a blanket and some stones and the stars over his head and whatever he could scrounge around to eat. You know, there was a lot of times that Paul didn't have anything. There was a lot of times Paul spent in prison and sometimes he spent his time in prison chained to a wall. And sometimes his prison was like, hey, you can stay in the governor's house. And you can, you know, so he, he had like this whole range of experiences. So it's not like this is like some guy who's like, I've learned how to be content, who's always lived at a certain level. He has been at every level you can imagine. And, you know, probably things that he found was that wonderful things can overwhelm you. You can get to where you feel like, I don't think I could live without all these things. A lack of things can make you feel angry when you, when you don't have things. It can make you feel insecure. But whether you feel overwhelmed by the amount of good things or whether you feel insecure by the lack of things, those kind of feelings lead to an inability to serve God. But contentment puts us in a great place. And the word content is an interesting word because this is going to lead us into Paul's secret. But the word content is the Greek word atarkes, probably. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce Greek words. A-U-T-A-R-K-E-S, atarkes. But what that word means is to be self-sufficient and self-complacent. And so that's when he uses the word content, the definition of content that people would have heard is I know how to be like able to rely on myself or I know how to be complacent within myself. But then Paul gives a very interesting verse. In Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that verse is the complete antithesis of the definition of contentment. Whereas contentment is saying, I have enough that I can be self-sufficient or I can be self-complacent. Paul says, no, I've learned that the secret to contentment is actually allowing Christ to do it, letting Christ strengthen me. Contentment is a result of bowing my heart and mind to the will of God, no matter the conditions I face, no matter the situation, this will lead to contentment where you're neither overwhelmed by poverty, nor are you intoxicated by prosperity. Paul is not saying in this verse, Philippians 4.13, that he can do anything that he puts his mind to. Now, I know that that's basically what this verse is used for in Christianity today. And, you know, one of my heroes, Tim Tebow, you know, stuck the Philippians 4.13 on his, I don't even know what those things are called, but I, I, they're not eye patches, but <laughs> they block the sun from glaring off your cheekbones. But anyways, he, he stuck them there. Philippians 4.13, there's, you know, other people that have them, like, put up athletes that have it sewn up under their hat. You know, it's a real common athlete verse, or it's a real common, like, student prayer verse. You know, like, I didn't study for my test, but Lord, I pray that you would just give me everything I need to pass this test. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, you know... <laughs> I tell you what, God will make you content even when you fail that test because you didn't prepare for it. But what this verse in context means is that, that no matter what situation you're in, you can be content in it because it's Christ who strengthens you. That's the real context of this verse. That whether you have a lot, whether you have a little, whether things are going good in your life, whether things are going bad in your life, whether everything is working out perfectly or everything is disastrous and your life is a dumpster fire, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can be content and happy and full of joy 
because it's Christ that's in you. And that's the secret to contentment. See, he says that by Christ's strength, I can be calm in adversity and I can be humble in prosperity because that's what's truly needed. And he says that contentment is learned, right? In verse 11, I have learned. Contentment is learned. It's not something that just comes automatically when we get saved. There's a lot of things that we're given when we get saved. There's a lot of things that are like fruit of the Spirit, right? The more we walk in the Spirit, the more we'll display that fruit. Contentment is not one of those things. It's not listed as a fruit. It's not listed as part of the things that we just get when we get saved. You know, like you get righteousness, you get justification, you get, you know, the mind of Christ. These things come automatically when we're saved. We have to sort of learn how to walk in them and use them, but contentment is not. Contentment is learned. How did Paul learn this? Well, I mentioned before about him going through everything, but I think it goes way beyond that. I think he learned it because of discontentedness. Because his discontentedness of knowing Christ from chapter 3, that led to the contentment and circumstances in chapter 4. Let me explain. (laughs) In Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, listen to Paul. These are not the words of someone who is content with this situation. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing on toward the... Oh, and sorry, I switched to a different translation. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You should not memorize passages of Scripture in a different translation than you write them out in because it will mess you up. These are not the words of someone who's content. This is discontentedness. You know, he's saying things like, I don't count myself to have apprehended. He said, if by any means I could obtain to the resurrection of the dead, I am pressing on. I do, you know, I'm forgetting those things. I'm reaching forward to this. This is someone who's very discontent. Paul is discontent with his relationship with Jesus Christ. He's discontent with how much he knows Jesus. And this is Paul. This is Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. This is, you know, Paul, the guy who wrote two-thirds of the, of the gospel, of the New Testament, sorry, of the New Testament. You know, and he's like, I am, I am not content at all with how much I know Christ. In fact, I'm counting everything else in my life as garbage, as complete trash in light of the surpassing knowledge of Jesus. And so I'm just going to press in and I'm going to get it. And what I'm going to tell you is that our contentment is grounded in our union with Jesus. And that's a reason why Philippians 3.10, this passage that we just did, it precedes Philippians 4.10, where he now says, I've learned contentment. His discontentedness in knowing Christ led to his contentment in his circumstances. You see, Christian contentment is independent of my circumstances. It's not, has nothing to do, my contentedness has nothing to do with what's going on in my life. Is what's going on good? Is what's going on bad? Am I abounding? Am I abasing? Is that a word? It's because my contentedness is found in my union with Jesus. And that's a constant throughout my life. And so therefore I can be content in any situation. The knowing of Christ is what makes this possible. You see, if what we do in our Christian relationship, if what we do when we get together on a Sunday morning or on a Thursday or whatever we're doing in our daily devotions, anything, if any of this stuff is simply behavioral modification, if all it is is saying, I I need to act more like a Christian, how do I act more like Jesus? If all that is is behavioral modification, then it's never going to lead to contentment. It's never going to actually change us. It might change how you present yourself to the outside world, but it doesn't actually change you. And so getting to know Christ 
is what actually changes us. Knowing principles and knowing the right things is not the same as knowing Christ. And the more that I know Christ, the more content I can become because my contentment is a result of an ever deepening relationship with Christ. And a lot of times we don't make those connections, but Paul lays it out for us in transitioning from Philippians 3 to Philippians 4. And if you just read that, those two chapters together, you see him talking about how much he pursues Christ leading into how content he is in whatever situation he finds himself. You see, Christian contentment is the fruit of having no higher ambition than to belong to the Lord and to be entirely at his disposal. When that becomes our goal, the knowing Christ fulfills us. When our goal is truly to know him and to be his, fully surrendered to him, then contentment is within our grasp. When our goals become something of the world, it will always be beyond our grasp. Contentment is a hallmark of a mature Christian, but it's something that's seldom valued in people. It's something that is not generally looked at, <laughs> speaking of envy, when we look at other people to think, I wish I could be content like that person. <laughs> Mostly it's, I wish I could have what that person has, or I wish I could be what that person is, or these things, but nobody tends to highly value the contented person. And yet contentment in all things is actually a sign of maturity in Christ. And I wanna leave with this verse. This is Isaiah 26, three. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And I just think that that speaks a, a lot about where our peace comes from. I think that you could easily translate this to content, contentedness. You know, you will keep that person content whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have actually given us everything we need for life and godliness, even as you promised. We're thankful, Lord, that contentedness is not out of our grasp. But Lord, as we pursue you, as we put our mind on you, as we know you more, I pray that you would fill us with more and more contentedness. And Lord, as I pray that if anyone has ever had troubles with being content, has ever struggled with that, God, I pray that you would begin to develop a, I don't know, that relationship that is more pursuing you. Lord, I pray that you would awaken them to look more of their eyes on you, to, to run after you, to have that attitude that Paul had in Philippians 3, where he said he just puts everything else behind him and presses and strains toward knowing you. Father, I pray that you would awaken that in every one of us. And Lord, we do want to know you more. We do want to reach for the high calling of, of Christ Jesus to attain to your resurrection, to, in, to know what that is, to live out that victory, that resurrected victory that you have made available to us. So we honor you and we bless your name. Amen.